This is going to be a study on the subject of David's mighty men. We can learn many lessons from the mighty men in the Bible. And while they were mighty men in the physical sense, we can be mighty men in the spiritual sense. So let's look at the characteristics of these men and see what we can learn. Second Samuel 23 and verse 8 says this, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tecmonite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against eight hundred, whom he slew at one time. And this brings us to our first point, which is, if God be for us, who can be against us? And that's what it says in Romans 8.31. What shall we then say to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? God was for Adino the Esnite. He had God working on his side, while the 800 men had Satan on their side. Multitudes of enemies mean absolutely nothing if you're in the Lord's army. You don't have to worry about how many numbers of people are against you if you're on God's side. A dino didn't even need a sword in this fight. He was using a spear. And our weapon is a sharp two-edged sword, which is the King James Bible. Maybe you are out in a spiritual battle and you only have a small New Testament in your pocket. There is enough power in that small book to defeat any spiritual wickedness. It isn't even the full sword, or even half of the sword, but it is enough if you use it with a believing heart. Knowing God was on his side, I doubt a dino was scared of the 800 enemies. Psalms 3, 6 says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Psalms 56, 11, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. All of these action movie stars have beat up hundreds of characters on camera. But Adino the Esnite did it in real life and all at one time. The power of God is so untouchable that Hollywood can't even counterfeit it correctly. If God is for us and we are doing the will of God, it really doesn't matter how many men are against us. It only matters what God thinks anyway. Men can only kill the body. Matthew 10:28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. A dino, the Esnite, obviously didn't have the fear of man. Proverbs 29 and 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And I'm sure he worked out and was trained to go to war, but he would have been nothing without the Lord. If God wanted him to die, the weakest soldier could have come behind him and blindsided him and killed him. And then 2 Samuel 23, 9 and 10 says, And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave into the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So our second point is a mighty man for God will fight alone if he has to. A lot of men won't do anything by themselves, and this is common in young people. They don't want to go anywhere or do anything alone. But Eliezer was the opposite. Him and David were alone and still fought when everyone else ran away. David is a type of Christ, 
so Eliezer could picture the Christian who stands to fight alongside Jesus Christ when everyone else has fled. Notice in verse 10 of 2 Samuel 23, it says, Eliezer smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. And there have been preachers and teachers who have wrote things to edify the body of Christ until their hands were weary. Eliezer's hand was weary, but he stuck with it. Just like we should stay in the King James Bible, even though much study is a weariness to the flesh. The King James Bible is our sword that we should hold on to. Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 says, And further by these my son be admonished, of many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. And many times reading the Bible, it is the most exciting thing in the world, and then sometimes for hours of study, after hours and hours of reading and studying, you begin to get weary. In these situations, we should remember 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Someone who studies the word of God is a workman. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So you're a workman who labors in the word and doctrine. And we do this even until our hands get weary, similar to Eliezer. The words of God are like a perfect meal to the Bible believer. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 compares the word of God to milk. Hebrews chapter 5 likens it to strong meat. Uh, if you don't labor in the word, then you won't eat. You need a hunger for the word. This hunger only gets satisfied by being a workman. And I would apply 2 Thessalonians 3.10 to the word of God as well as physical work for literal food. It says, For even when we were with you, this week I commanded you, then if eating would not work, neither should he eat. We work until we are weary to provide food for our family. Because 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Just like we study the word to be able to provide godly wisdom and be able to feed our family spiritually, and teach the doctrine of the Bible to our family. So it says his hand clave into the sword. He wouldn't let it go. And a mighty man for God will hold on to the sword, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Psalms 149.6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Through Eliezer, the Lord had a great victory that day. And then what happens? The people returned after him only to spoil. They came back to try and get the blessings and for the celebration. Many Christians won't fight but they want to reap the benefits of those who do fight. They want to have all the good things that happen after someone gets a victory, but they don't want to help get the victory. And that's why the verse says they returned only to spoil. Second Samuel 23, 11 says, And after him was Shammah, the son of A.G. the Herorite and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. So number three, a mighty man for God will defend the things of God. It says he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. So Shammah, firmly stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. 
As Christians, we need to stand fast, meaning we need to have a firm, fixed, standing position. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. If you have the truth and know it, then you can have boldness. If you are walking in righteousness, then you have a boldness and confidence that only God can give you. A righteous man who is bold in the truth can make it through anything. He knows God is real, and he is in close fellowship. These two things are needed to be happy as a Christian. With these two things in your favor, you can go to war alongside God just as easy as Shema. And with these things being said, we should remember to read the Word of God, which is the truth, and stay righteous. Try our best to live righteous, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. As Christians, our weapons aren't carnal. We defend the gospel through laboring in the scriptures. So that way, we can expose any false prophets and teachers. We know when we're being deceived, or when someone's trying to deceive us, if we read the Bible and get grounded and settled in the truth. Philippians 1 7 says, Even as, as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. Notice the word defense. We need to defend the gospel. Philippians 1 17, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Our job is to defend the gospel and the King James Bible. A great example of someone who defended the words of God, even when he was basically alone, is Peter S. Ruckman. He defended the King James Bible when it wasn't popular in any group to be King James only. And the majority of KJV guys today should give double honor to Ruckman simply for this reason alone. And here is an article I read about Ruckman and his stance on the King James Bible. It says this. It says the fundamentalists stood for the major points of true Christianity, but they do not completely believe in the authority of the Bible. They believe the inspired Bible was the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, and they believe the new versions of the Bible were acceptable. To affirm this, take a look at what the recognized fundamentalist leaders of the past have said. John R. Rice said this, When we say that the Bible is inspired, we do not refer to the translations or copies, but to the original autographs. Translations are not inspired. I have for years checked up with scriptures in the American Standard Version, that is, the 1901 version, and find it very valuable. So, John R. Rice wasn't a Bible believer. He didn't believe the King James was perfect. He's considered a great man of God by many people. And then Curtis Hudson said this, There is no perfect English translation. This is why we study Greek and Hebrew. The Bible is indeed the Word of God insofar as it agrees with the wording of the original Greek and Hebrew autographs. The original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts are the inerrant Word of God. So he's not a Bible believer. He doesn't believe the King James Bible is perfect. So John R. Rice and Hudson are considered great men, but they aren't Bible believers. And many Bible seminaries are mainly responsible for the spread of doubt against the King James Version. The reason is because the fundamentalist pastors have trained in Bible seminaries into thinking only originals, only the originals are given by inspiration of God. And those seminaries would promote modern versions, correct the KJV with Greek or Hebrew, or admit the KJV is not given by inspiration of God except the originals. The article goes on to say, Fundamentalists now convert to KJV-onlyism. 
However, we now have some fundamentalist leaders claiming to believe and teach the KJV as given by inspiration of God. Jack Kyles used to correct the King James Bible, but in his sermon about the King James Bible, he preached, I just believe that the King James Bible is that preserved word or words of God. I believe that all the other versions in the English language are perversions. I think that the preserved words of God are in the King James Bible. That means I think the NIV is a perversion. The ASV is a perversion. The NASV is a perversion. The New King James is a perversion. And the New Schofield is a perversion. John R. Rice, founder of the Sword of the Lord, used to recommend the American Standard Version. But on January 16th through the 18th, 2008, Shelton Smith, current editor of the Sword of the Lord, and a few fundamentalist ministers had a King James Bible conference at Franklin Road Baptist Church rejecting the new versions and defending the inspiration of the KJV. In the old days of fundamentalism, the fundamentalists did not believe the King James Bible was the words of God given by inspiration, yet many of them now finally say the King James Bible is given by inspiration of God, which Dr. Ruckman has always defended and has been criticized by fundamentalists. And then the article also says fundamentalists owe their KJV stand to Dr. Ruckman. It must be realized that if it was not for the unyielding KJV stand of Ruckman, many fundamentalists today would not have believed in the inspiration of the King James Bible. It was earlier than 1960 when Ruckman stood for the inspiration of the King James Bible while exposing the fraud of fundamentalist scholarship. He published manuscript evidence around 1970, which opened the eyes of Christians to the inspiration of the KJV. It was after many years of his KJV stand that there were finally others publicly supporting the KJV-only movement. Not one individual during those times had known any other Christian leader, excluding Ruckman, who stood for the inspiration of the King James Bible. Lloyd L. Streeter co-pastor of PCC, even admitted the older generation of fundamentalists were deceived by conservative scholars into thinking there is no inspiration of the King James. Dr. Sam Gipp and William Grady are both well known for their books in defending the King James Bible. Their books have been widely accepted and supported by many fundamentalists to their stand for the King James Bible. But what must be known is Sam Gipp graduated from Ruckman School. William Grady opened his eyes to the King James Bible issues from Ruckman's book, Manuscript Evidence. If Ruckman had not stood for the King James, then those men would not have produced such knowledgeable, acclaimed books that defended the KJV. As a matter of fact, William Grady believed firmly from historical examination. But that was a good article. And even this newer independent Baptist movement today who hate Ruckman most likely wouldn't have been King James only if Ruckman hadn't took a stand or he, if he hadn't took such a stand for the word of God. Sure, God probably would have raised up another man to do this task. But the lack of respect and lack of double honor given to Ruckman is pretty bad. They hate both Ruckman and Gipp, two great defenders of the King James Version. They claim to appreciate Sam Gipp's books on the King James Version, but would give Gipp a hard time about some other things he believes, which are really beside the point. And Gipp wouldn't have been such a King James Bible believer if he hadn't sat under Ruckman. These guys bash Ruckman and claim he wasn't even saved, all because they disagree with a lot of his doctrine. They will even call Ruckman a psycho and tell Sam Gipp to go to hell from behind the pulpit. And I don't agree with what they are saying in James Bible and any work that they are doing to promote it. And then Second Samuel twenty three fourteen says, And David was then in a hold, 
and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem. That was by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. So number four, a mighty man for God will want God to get the glory. Many Christians would be mad at what David did here. They would have said something like, I went through all that trouble and then you pour the water out on the ground. I thought you were thirsty. I risked my life to get that water. But the mighty men knew this was a drink offering and they knew God was getting the praise and glory through their victory. And many people are doing the work of a Christian to make a name for themselves. They are making it out to be a business. They are making a lot of money. The glory isn't going to God. It's going to them. And you can tell by the look on their faces when they get long applauses, when they stand up to preach. It's sick stuff that goes on. So these mighty men did what they thought David wanted. David is a type of Christ. Lesson learned, we should do what we can to please Jesus Christ. These three mighty men weren't told to go get that water, but they knew David wanted it. And I'd also like to point out that water is also connected to the words of God. Ephesians 5.26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The psalmist in Psalms 119.9 writes, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? John 15.3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. The washing of water by the word purifies the Christian. John 7.38 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus Christ is living water. John 4.10-14 through 14 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. Jesus Christ is the living word, and the Bible is the written word. If we stay in fellowship with God and reading his word, then we are like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So just like the three mighty men put their lives in jeopardy for the water, from the well of Bethlehem, we should be willing to do this for the Lord Jesus Christ in his words. And then Second Samuel twenty three eighteen and 19 says, And Abisha, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief among three, and he lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them, and had the name among the three. Was he not most honorable of the three? Therefore he was their captain, howbeit how be he attained not unto the first three. And you see more about this guy Abisha is written in Second Samuel twenty one sixteen. Second Samuel twenty one fifteen says Moreover the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him, and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Binab, which was one of the sons of the giant, 
the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword thought to have slain David, but Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. So a mighty man of God will stick his neck out for Jesus Christ. David, as I said before, is a type of Jesus Christ. Abisha risked his life to save David, who was about to be slain by the giant named Ishbi Benob. And Jesus Christ doesn't need our help. But it pleases God when we suffer for his name. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Just imagining this fight in your head is entertaining. Who says the Bible is a boring book? There is something awesome about seeing a little guy beat up a big giant. And that is why this is counterfeited <clears throat> in every action movie. And you have always have a huge bad guy or bully that is taken down by the underdog. And then 2 Samuel twenty three twenty and 21 says, And Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzil, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in a time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, and he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. So number six, a mighty man for God won't back down from the flesh, the world, and the devil. And this small story, the lion-like men who whom Benaiah fights, can represent your flesh. The lion can represent the devil. And since Egypt is a type of the world in the Bible, the Egyptian can represent the world. And the spear in the Egyptian's hand can represent the thing in the world that wants to kill you. So he slew lion-like men. These weren't sissy men, possibly even hybrids of some sort. And when man gets in the flesh, he acts like a beast. We're living in a time when people act like animals. They have no shame to walk around naked and fornicate in public. Our flesh is capable of any sin if we stray, stray away from God long enough. We need to fight the flesh and beat down the beast. Paul talks about dying daily. We need to reckon the flesh dead. Why live for dead flesh? Our flesh is not going to heaven. Your soul is going to heaven. That's why we're getting a new body. The Christian soldier has a battle with the flesh until he dies or until the rapture. Not only did Benaiah slay two lion-like men, he also slew a lion in the midst of a pit in a time of snow. The lion can represent Satan who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Benaiah is in a pit. Sometimes the devil can make you feel like you are in hell on earth. It is a time of snow. The devil comes at you during hard times. Snow brings hard times. We aren't strong enough to defeat the devil, but we can quote scripture to make him leave us alone for a while. Just like Jesus Christ did in Matthew chapter 4. And even Michael the archangel didn't bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Next, Benaiah fights the Egyptian. And the parallel passage for this verse says the Egyptian was a man of great stature. In First Chronicles 11.23 So the Egyptian is a man of great stature and he represents a big world. It is a big world out there full of sin and haters of God. And the Bible says love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It says a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Paul calls this world a present evil world. Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, loving this present world. We don't want to be like Demas and give in to the things of the world. We want to be like Benaiah and overcome the Egyptian. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. John sixteen thirty three says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We have overcome the world because the one living inside of us has overcome this present evil world. 
Why walk around according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air? We are a child of God, not a children of disobedience. But if you are a lost man and you don't want to be a child of hell or a child of the devil, a child of wrath or a child of disobedience, then you need to get saved. And we are saved by putting our trust in the gospel to save us. And the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So Jesus Christ died by shedding his blood. He shed his blood for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He shed his blood for you because you are a sinner and you deserve eternal punishment. In a lake of fire. And if you will come to Jesus Christ. As the guilty sinner that you are. And believe on him. And what he did on the cross. Then you can be saved. And escaped. And escape hell. So realize. You are a guilty sinner. In need of a savior. And come to the one. Who can save you. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who was crucified for your sins. Buried and rose again the third day. He shed his blood to pay for your sin. The Bible says in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So come to him for salvation today before it's too late.